that sunshine looks mighty tasty. That's right, this person is eating sunshine. Dining on sunshine doesn't sound very filling, but sunlight is the source of everything we eat. From 150 million kilometers away, the sun radiates energy, and we receive that energy as heat and light. Green plants take the light and convert it into food, providing the many animals of the world with the energy they need to grow. The sun's energy is the source of life on Earth. That energy is passed on when one organism consumes an energy-rich substance. When a mouse eats grass, it gets energy. When a snake eats that mouse for lunch, the snake gets the energy that the mouse had. Eventually, the snake dies and insects help the body to decompose. Each organism in this process has a name, producer, consumer, or decomposer. The producers make the food, the consumers eat the food, and the decomposers dispose of the waste. They're all part of the food chain. Here's how it works. It all starts with the energy from the sun which is used by living organisms as it shines down on the earth. Plants use that energy as food and grow. But grass does a lot more than just grow. In fact, if it weren't for this grass and all the other green plants on the planet, you wouldn't have to cut it because you wouldn't be around. Plants are what we call producers. That's because they produce food and oxygen. Only plants are capable of photosynthesis, the process of making food out of light. This tree-like plant draws minerals and water from the soil. It takes in carbon dioxide from the air, and with all that great light the sun provides, the plant makes basic sugars and starches for food. The processes that occur during photosynthesis require a chemical called chlorophyll, which gives plants their green color. Along with sunlight and other materials, chlorophyll traps the energy from sunlight and creates an energy-rich sugar from carbon dioxide and water. This sugar is food, the source of energy for the plant and any animal that eats the plant. All life is dependent on plants the producers, as the first link in the food chain. The next links of a food chain are the consumers. They're the organisms that eat the producers. These animals are taking in energy as they eat plants. They are consuming. Animals that consume plants are called herbivores. Like these zebras, herbivores are primary consumers. They get their energy directly from plants. Some animals hunt other animals in order to obtain energy. These meat-eating animals are called carnivores. This lion is a carnivore. It gets its energy by eating herbivores like this zebra. Because the lion's energy comes from the zebra and not directly from the plants, it is a secondary consumer. Lions are considered secondary consumers because they're two steps from the original energy of the sun. Some animals eat both plants and animals in order to obtain their energy. These animals are called omnivores. Even though all of these animals are eating different things, they are all consumers. Each one of them is getting a share of the sun's energy. 
The animals that hunt and eat other animals are called predators, and the animals they eat are called prey. All predators are carnivores, but not all carnivores are predators. Some creatures eat the leftovers that predators leave behind, or wait for animals to die, after which they eat the dead carcass. They are called scavengers. As we've said, energy is passed from the sun to the plants, then from one animal to the next. The waste and remains from animals that die is reduced into substances such as carbon dioxide and nitrogen compounds like ammonia through the process of decay and decomposition. The carbon dioxide can then be taken in and used by plants right away. The nitrogen compounds are absorbed by the soil and then taken into the plants for their use. When animals eat the plants, the animals get the nitrogen. When other animals eat those animals, they too get the nitrogen, as do decomposers when they feed on waste and remains. We refer to this as the nitrogen cycle. One of the insect decomposers is the dung beetle. These animals actually eat animal waste, or dung, as food. They work hard to get it, too. When they find it, they shape it into a ball and roll it into their nest in the ground. That way, it's always handy. These beetles also lay their eggs in the ball, and the babies feed on it when they hatch. You may have seen flesh-eating insects in movies, but it's all fiction, just to scare you. Though some people think insects are yucky, they're actually very valuable animals. For example, these beetles, called dermestid beetles, can slowly eat the flesh off of bodies that are already dead. Now that is yucky. But these beetle decomposers are an important part of the food chain. Would you believe they can be very useful to museums, too? You've probably seen animal skeletons in museums. They're so neat and clean, they almost look like sculptures. But when the dead animals first come in, there's a lot of flesh on those bones. And cleaning the flesh off those bones by hand would be hard, messy work. So, bring in the beetles. The dermestid beetles eat the old flesh off the bones. Depending on the size and condition of the dead animal, this can take a week or longer. And most of the eating is done by the baby beetles, called larvae. The larvae look like maggots with lots of hairs. The beetles are so good at what they do that the people who work in the museum can't keep up with them. The cleaned bones have to be stored, waiting until there is time to put them together again as skeletons. So, the beetles in the museum do the same thing as other decomposers, such as bacteria, worms, and other insects. They break down the flesh, single-handedly taking care of all the messy work. It's yet another reason why decomposers, such as our domestic beetles, are one of the most important parts of the food chain. There are relationships between all living and non-living things in an area. Those relationships make up what is called an ecosystem. Each part of an ecosystem depends on all the other parts in that ecosystem for survival. Everything in nature has a place and serves a purpose in passing energy to other species through a food chain. Some food chains have more links than others. For example, when you eat celery or carrots, that's a food chain with two links in it. Because you're the top consumer in that food chain. Other food chains have as many as five links because they contain more secondary consumers. A beetle might eat a seed, a lizard might eat the beetle, a snake might eat the lizard, another snake might eat the first one, and finally, a hawk might eat the bigger snake five links in the food chain. It's the same process in food chains everywhere. We've seen how food chains work on land. Now let's see how they work in the water. 
animals that eat plants are consumed by larger predators, which become prey for still larger creatures. In the water, and especially in the ocean, there are tiny organisms called plankton. Some plankton are plants. These are called phytoplankton. These tiny, one-celled phytoplankton contain chlorophyll, just like land plants. That means they are producers, because they can perform photosynthesis and produce food. Some plankton are tiny animals that feed on the phytoplankton. These are called zooplankton. Some of these tiny animals are the larvae, or babies, of larger animals like fish and shrimp. The tiny zooplankton become food for larger water-dwelling creatures, such as this butterfly fish, a secondary consumer. Small fish may become meals for larger fish, like sharks. It takes a lot of energy to support all of the animals in a food chain. There has to be an enormous number of small animals to support the larger animals that eat them. This is called an energy pyramid, and you'll soon see why. As we move up the food chain, we find that although the predators get bigger in size, they're fewer in number. At the top of the chain, the number of large predators, such as sharks and tigers, is relatively small in comparison to the large populations of smaller animals, like mice, that comprise the lower end of a food chain. If we counted the number of organisms at each feeding level to reach this boy eating fish sticks, we would find that it takes millions of phytoplankton to feed hundreds of thousands of zooplankton. These are eaten by thousands of small fish, which in turn will be eaten by the hundreds of larger fish which it would take to nourish this boy. You can see that the numbers form a pyramid with millions of phytoplankton at the base. In 1927, an ecologist named Charles Elton did a study in which he counted all of the insects, small mammals, and birds that were eaten in a food chain. He calculated the weight, or biomass, of the organisms at each level of the food chain. Elton saw that these numbers formed a pyramid. There was a far greater biomass at the lower levels of the pyramid than at the top. This shows us how important it is to ensure large numbers of a species survive at the bottom of a pyramid in order to ensure the survival of the few predators at the top. As each organism is consumed, the amount of energy that is passed on becomes less and less. Organisms use up energy when they grow, move, or reproduce. That means that they can't pass on all of the energy that they consume in the form of food. Only about 10% of the total energy gets passed up from one energy level to the next. The pyramid shows that there are fewer big animals in the world than small animals. You cannot have more predators than you have prey. You cannot even have an equal number because soon there would not be enough food for the predators to eat and survive, and then they would die out. So far, we've looked at food chains as simple pathways. A food chain is a simple way of tracking the flow of energy. But food chains don't tell the whole story. They only show a small portion of the total energy flow. For example, this rabbit eats grass. Cows also eat grass. And this lynx eats rabbits. But lynxes are not the only animals to eat rabbits. Wolves also eat them. And both lynxes and wolves eat other animals, such as squirrels. This is an example of food chains overlapping. The food chain which includes grass and a squirrel and a wolf overlaps or connects with a food chain including grass, a rabbit, and a lynx. Food chains are connected to each other. It can happen at many levels. The connections between food chains form a food web. Webs provide a balance among all of the animals in an ecosystem. A change in any one factor in a food web will affect all the other parts of the environment. Let's look at one scenario. Farmer Wilson discovers that some of the sheep are being eaten by foxes. She sets traps to catch the foxes and ships them off to zoos around the country. But 
She soon discovers that she has a problem with mice and rabbits because there are no foxes to keep their populations in balance. The rabbits and mice eat all of the grass, causing the sheep to starve because of a lack of food. This is a perfect example of the impact humans can have on an ecosystem. It's a strange twist that in the quest to produce food, humans often cause long-term damage to the food chains and webs around them. When trees are removed from a rainforest to create farms, smaller animals lose their food source and this causes a reduction in their numbers. This will mean less food for the consumers of these animals and that will affect animals higher on the chain. Due to hunting, pesticides, and clearing away forests, humans can have drastic effects on the environment. Natural events, such as floods, droughts, and brush fires can also change the natural balance through the loss of plants and small animals that are unable to escape the fires or floodwaters. Larger animals are often able to move to safer surroundings, but also often die if there's not enough food available to survive. By upsetting the balance between carnivores and herbivores, natural disasters can cause explosions in some animal populations and extinctions in others. Remember, any change in an ecosystem, whether it's the result of nature or the result of human activity, can have a devastating effect on food chains and webs. This is true with large animals and tiny ones. Look out, we can't see the screen! Sit down! It might come as a surprise to you, but an entire food chain can fit in one drop of water. That's right, a drop of water can be full of microscopic plants, herbivores, carnivores, and decomposers. Most of them too small to see without the help of a microscope. Today, we are going to see this process in action. We'll watch a microscopic food chain develop from scratch. For today's experiment, you will need a handful of grass, a medicine dropper, some distilled water, a microscope, a notepad and pencil, microscope slides and covers, a saucepan, and an electric burner. Be sure to ask an adult to help you gather these materials and to carry out the procedure. When you're ready, pour the water into the saucepan and have an adult turn the burner on. Then, place the grass into the water, boiling the mixture for several minutes on the stove. This boiling will destroy any organisms present, creating a nutritious grass soup to help get the food chain started. After it is cooled, remove a dropper full of the mixture and place it on a microscope slide. Then, place a slide cover on the slide. Observe and draw what you see under the microscope. Every two days, make a new slide from your grass soup and draw what you see on your notepad. On your first day's observation, you should see nothing alive at all in the water. Two days later, you will probably see tiny dots floating around in tiny currents. These are bacteria. How did they get there? Well, bacteria are always present in the air. They settle onto the water from the air and feed on the grass soup. So this food chain actually starts with decomposers. Microscopic plants, like algae, will soon begin to appear as well. These are your producers. After a couple more days, other tiny creatures will appear to feed on the algae and bacteria. These are your herbivores and first carnivores. Eventually, paramecia will appear in large numbers. Be sure to diagram this and other stages on your notepad through the experiment. In the final stage, the populations of all the creatures in the water mixture will begin to balance out. It should take about a week for your food chain to fully stabilize. Bacteria and green algae will be at the bottom of the food chain. Rotifers, 
and amoebas will be the dominant carnivores in this food chain. Unless some daphnia or water fleas have shown up. Then they're the big beasts. And it's all grown in just a few days. If life is to continue on Earth, humans must use their intelligence to preserve the food-bearing cycles that nature has established. We can preserve plants and trees in wetlands and forests, which provide sanctuaries for the tremendous number of species of animals, as well as provide much of the planet's supply of oxygen. As you can see, it's important to know as much as possible about food chains, and you've learned a lot here. You know the food chain is made up of producers that transform sunlight into food. Energy is passed on when the consumers eat the plants and is again passed on as larger consumers, called predators, eat smaller prey. This process continues until the energy reaches the top of the food chain. What remains is reduced to basic elements, including substances like nitrogen and carbon dioxide, in order for the cycle to continue. A cycle that starts here. The sun, the center of our solar system, is the ultimate source of energy for our Earth. The light from the sun supplies energy for every living organism on this planet. Without the sun's energy and the food chain, this would become this. The energy from this star is converted into forms that sustain life on our planet. Through food chains and webs, from the sun to the producers, the consumers, and the decomposers. Nature efficiently uses energy in a life-supporting cycle called the food chain.